welcome to worship for this Transfiguration Sunday, which marks the beginning of uh, the last Sunday before Lent. Wednesday will be Ash Wednesday. Uh, you will be receiving a uh, mailing that should uh, is meant to help you worship at home, if that's what you choose to do, with a little Ash Wednesday liturgy. And then there's also worship here at noon and at 6. And if the 6 o'clock reservations fill up, we will add a 7 p.m. one as well. Uh, we will also, during Lent, be sending out a Hold an Evening Prayer with, yes, even dramas recorded. So we're trying to do everything we can as Lent approaches to make it a meaningful and a special time for you and loved ones and friends. I hope you, may, you can use them. Let us begin our worship, as we always do, with confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, whose voice is upon the waters, whose mercy is poured out upon all people, whose goodness cascades over all creation. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin, our own sins, and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We often use, we often use before we give. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace. Through the power and promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community, living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, the resplendent light of your truth shines from the mountaintop into our hearts. Transfigure us by your beloved Son and illumine the world with your image through Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hi, Miss Jenny. Hey, Deacon Sandra. What you doing there? Well, I have all these letters that we don't use during the six weeks of Lent, so I thought I would pack them away and put them in this box and take them back out at Easter. Oh, okay. Wait, what? We don't use certain letters during Lent. I've never heard that. Well, it's not so much that we don't use certain letters as we don't use a certain word in our worship during Lent. Okay, well, let's see. Now, Lent is the time between Ash Wednesday and Easter Sunday. We know that. And so I'm trying to think about what word we wouldn't use. It'll be like a game. I'm going to try to guess it. Okay, okay, let's see. There's some different letters, and I'll see if I put different ones together. There's a L and a U. L luau. We don't have luau's during Lent. I, I don't know. Maybe, that's I don't that's not that's it, Miss Sandra. I don't think that's it. Let's see. What else? Um, there's an A and an L. A ale. We don't drink ginger ale during Lent. Is that it? Well, maybe you don't, but that's not it either. That's not it either. Okay. Well, maybe you're just going to have to tell me. It's Alleluia. We don't sing Alleluia oh, during Lent. Oh, I knew that. I knew that. Okay. Remember that in the Lutheran Church and in some other traditions too, during Lent we're focusing on repentance. That's turning back to God. Right. And during that time, it's kind of a more meditative time and we're thinking about our sins and what God did for us. And since we want the music and the words of our worship to match the feel of the worship, we don't sing celebratory words like Alleluia. That's right. I remember that. And 
it makes Easter Sunday so much more special because we can sing hallelujah and we can say Christ is risen. So, bye bye, hallelujah. See you on April 4th. Bye, hallelujah. See you on Easter. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from 1 Kings. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elijah were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elijah, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elijah said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elijah and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elijah, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elijah and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, yes. Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they, were both, as they both were standing by the Jordan. When Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up and struck the water, the water was parted to one side and to the other, until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha said, Please, let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elijah kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. The word of the Lord. A reading from 2 Corinthians. Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the, for it is the God who said, Let lines let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The word of the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Holy Gospel, according to Mark. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. 
and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, I've been thinking about this sermon a lot, I have to admit. I have been kind of stuck on a little bit. Maybe it's because the transfiguration comes around every year. It's in the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's pretty much the same in all three accounts. They have to preach on the same story. Maybe it's because it's such a fantastic event. It is hard for us to picture it. Maybe it's a little like Star Trek and the transporter beam, and suddenly there appears before them three, Jesus Moses and Elijah. And maybe, maybe it's just because as a preacher talking about this text, you end up feeling just a little inadequate. What do I mean? Well, in a way, the job or call of the preacher week in and week out is to convey some of this image that Peter and the others saw of the victorious and glorious Christ. To proclaim that yes, Christ is the fulfillment of all of God's promises from Moses to Elijah to today. These promises are of life, uh, life for all, and goodness despite pain, and justice despite what we see in our world, and compassion and mercy, even in the face of anger and hate. I could go on and on because this image before the disciples and before us today is meant to communicate all of those promises. It is meant to communicate to those who see it that in the end, God has the final word, and yes, we are to listen to that word. In preaching and the deed in all of our worship, we are called to communicate that and affirm that. To, if you will, in Paul's words, to kind of pull back the vision and give people a glimpse of the glory. Behold, or in the image of the Old Testament lesson, to give a vision, of people a vision like Elisha received, that affirms our call as God's servants and encourage us in the face of all difficulties. Because Elijah will face difficulties. The disciples will face great struggles. The disciples will witness the horror of the crucifixion. They are asked to hold on to their visions for Elisha, his vision, and for the disciples, their vision from this mountaintop to sustain them in more difficult and and darker times, troubling times. Times that in, in some ways, one way or another, maybe we face. Worship, and yes, preaching is meant to give us a vision, a word that is meant to sustain us to week in and week out as we face good moments and difficult moments. And yes, I am inadequate. I think all preachers are, but sometimes someone, a preacher, feels it more than others. We want to find the right story, or nowadays the right video maybe, or something that will communicate what the disciples saw. The problem is when we try to communicate the vision rather than the message. The vision, we we really can't articulate or adequately describe that, but can we communicate the message? Namely that Christ is meant to be the center of our lives, just as he was in the center of Moses and Elijah, but that in the end he is the center of history, of past and future. And since he is, we are told, and the disciples were told to listen to him, This, too, is what we are called to proclaim in preaching. Preachers are meant to encourage all of us to listen first and foremost to Christ. Oh, I know there are other voices we do need to heed. Maybe if you're a kid, the voice of a parent, or voices of loved ones, voices of teachers, voices for all of us of of other loved ones. There's, There's voices we need to listen to, but can we do so through the healing aid, if you will, of all that Christ has said? And what is the first thing that he says to those disciples after they have heard the voice to listen to him? They are told that they must wait until after the cross and resurrection. 
to tell anyone what they have seen. They must wait until they can incorporate the cross and the resurrection into this vision, as central to this vision. The cross, the suffering, the sacrifice, the forgiveness and mercy of God for a broken world, the cross of hate that does not have the final word, but resurrection has the final say, that in the end, his promise, his words, he spoke, that God's love will abide forever and that God's promises in the end will prevail for all people, that he is the one who stands in the center of our vision of history and of our, of our lives. It's a hard vision to embrace, I know. Sometimes it's so much easier to give up, to, to say that there is too much hate and division in this world to trust such a glorious vision. Sometimes it seems that those ugly tales are easier to tell. I just finished a book that our boys told me I had to read, and I think, just a little side note, as I did, I realized I think I've read it before when they told me to, but it, it's very engrossing. It's called Cloud Atlas, and some of you may have, have seen the movie. I would call it a dystopian novel, you know, opposite of utopia. It's a vision of, of, of a world that is dark, that where it seems evil has prevailed. You, you, you know that, that there are other uh, versions of things you may, may see like this, you know, those uh, zombie movies, if you will, or the Book of Eli, those things where evil has prevailed in the world and they're just clinging to hope. This author, this book of Cloud Atlas has said of this book, he says the book's theme is predacity, predacity, P-R-E-D-A-C-I-T-Y, which is the way individuals prey on individuals, on groups, on groups, nations, on nations, tribes, on tribes. He explores this theme in many times and locations. As I said, there are other movies or books that do this. The list could go on. Writers and directors and others seem to find it easy or meaningful or necessary to imagine and portray a very dark and dismal future for our world. It seems more difficult to imagine or to portray a different future, a future that God imagines without those things that tear us apart, that cause deep pain in our world, that bring about death and despair. But the book ends thus with, with one character who holds to hope and lives and he, I think he, it is he who, who speaks for the author. And, and let me quote. What precipitates outcomes? Vicious acts and virtuous deeds. What precipitates acts? Belief. Belief is both prize and battlefield with the mind and in the minds mirror the world. If we believe humanity is a ladder of tribes, a coliseum of confrontation, exploitation, and bestiality, such a humanity is surely brought into being. And history's evil people will prevail. You and I, the moneyed, the privileged, the fortunate, shall not fare so badly in this world, provided our luck holds. What of it if our consciences itch? Why undermine the dominance of our race, our gunships, our heritage, and our legacy? Why fight the natural order of things? Why? Because of this. One fine day, a purely predatory world shall consume itself. Yes, the devil shall take the hindmost until the foremost is the hindmost. In an individual, selfishness uglifies the soul. For the human species, selfishness is extinction. Is this the doom written within our nature? He goes on. If we believe that humanity may transcend tooth and claw, if we believe races and creeds can share this world as peaceably, if we believe leaders must be just, violence muzzled, power accountable, and the riches of the earth and its oceans shared equitably, such a world 
will come to pass. A life shaping a world I want my child to inherit, not one I fear he shall inherit. This strikes me as a life worth living. End quote. He is simply calling on himself to follow a different vision, different than he has experienced and witnessed. He is calling on himself and others to work to create a world shaped by a vision not of the strong devouring the weak, but of the strong working to strengthening the weak. We are asked to live by a different vision, to listen to the voice of that vision, to work to shape a world that lives up to that glorious and wonderful light of God. Until all the world sees Christ as the center, listening to his voice. So I end now, and I end knowing that, alas, as I said at the beginning, every sermon is inadequate. It in itself is not a brilliant vision on a mountaintop. But let me propose this. Maybe, maybe many sermons together from me or others, many worships over the years, many meals shared at an altar, many moments of care and compassion that you have experienced or given to others, that when you put all these smaller rays of light, smaller visions of God's glory together, well, together. Together then we can get a glimpse of the glory and goodness that is God and is indeed the center of our lives. Amen. Let us confess our faith together using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. For the gospel proclaimed in word and deed, for communities of faith far and near, and for all who show the face of Christ throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For nations and leaders, turn us from ways that lead to division. Shape new paths toward peace and cooperation, teaching us to recognize one another as neighbors. Guide our president, legislators, and civil servants to actions that protect the well-being of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those responsible for safety and protection, for policemen, firemen, and first responders, we pray for the members of the armed forces and for all those who put themselves in harm's way to keep us safe. Guide them, guard them, and bring them home safely, whole in body and mind. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all who suffer this day, that Christ our healer transforms sickness into health, loneliness into companionship, bereavement into consolation, and suffering into peace. We especially pray for Jim, Alan, Tom, and for those others whom we name now, silently or aloud. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For companions on life's journey in this worshiping community, for loved ones who cannot be with us, and for guidance during struggles we face, that God's glory is revealed around and among us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In thanksgiving for the faithful departed who now rest from their earthly pilgrimage, that their lives of service and prayer inspire us in our living, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people spoken or silent for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let us pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless you now and forever. Amen. Yeah. Uh -huh.
peace serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you.